Bye. All right, we're live. So welcome to this morning's discussion of Seifel, the pie. So any interesting characters, observations? Where do you want to start? We talk about like Elaine's her whole situation in the episode is very interesting that she finds this this mannequin that's you know a, I guess necessarily like a, sort of like a replica of her. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then I didn't really understand the ending. I don't know if that was like a character that was I didn't in the show, but it sounded like it was someone that knew her or her likeness. Or... Oops, I need to talk what to do with that. Well, and that was interesting too because I think they made it seem like she was having like a paranoid. Yeah, yeah. It turned out like it was. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was actually like yeah. an attempt behind a mannequin looking like her. Mm -hmm. I don't recognize him either. I'm not okay. sure if I want him any other. No, no. But I could not tell you that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what an Instagram user. Anybody, anybody here on Instagram? Yeah. Okay. So we pass that. Pause because you're not using the app. I definitely, I'm definitely using the app. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't know how to get it on there other than the app. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if if uh, this character presents to you in clinical practice and she has this sheet complaint, um, there's there's a, I think um, uh, the first idea here would be no, we're no idea. So, uh, by the way, we're not live streaming after all. So, if uh, anybody's having difficulty catching the live stream. Just know we're running some technical running into some technical difficulties and no good. It looks like it's it says live up here. The network in Florida does that. Oh. All right. Yeah. Maybe we'll exit out and we'll just try to yeah. get back on again. Yeah. Sorry. Are you sure you want to end your live video? Well, <laughs> it definitely. You're live streaming. We are live streaming. All right. So we're. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. False positive. Okay, now it looks like you ended it. Yeah. <laughs> so that again. We'll try, we'll try this one more time. I do apologize, guys. All right. Elaine Bennis presents to you uh, with a chief complaint for her initial evaluation with information provided through the plot this, or the subplot of this episode, The Pie. Uh, clinical Pearl. Number one, um, it, you know, I, I think for certainly previous to 2013, the American Psychiatric Association did classify delusions into two very broad categories, bizarre and non-bizarre. Uh, and there was thought that there was a differential diagnosis that was specific to each of these categories, right? And that the bizarre delusion lent more to a primary psychotic process such as schizophrenia. Um, in the latest revision of the DSM, that is really not the case. That's largely been discarded. In this case, though, Elaine's quote unquote, um, let's just say her, her thought that you identify as causing her clinically significant distress and impairment would have been considered non-bizarre. Right, that that something resembles her, and that uh, an owner or, or operator of this one particular boutique um, is causing her clinically significant distress or impairment. Um, whether the delusion is bizarre or non-bizarre, and here I want to I want to be emphatic: even if the delusion is considered to be bizarre, always always substantiate the nature of the delusion. Because um, in, in medical practice, we are always baffled on how weird and wild things can get, right? So even the most bizarre of content, please, please substantiate. Okay? Now, there's, of course, there's going to be a line to draw, but I want you to be open-minded as clinicians. And that's what happens here. I mean, we, I mean, not not that we necessarily, because uh, we're seeing it from a third person perspective. But if we were that psychiatrist and this particular patient was referred to us, if we don't think like that, if we don't have that perspective, that unconditional positive regard, we may have jumped at the conclusion that our patient struggling with a delusion. 
-hmm. when in fact, then we realize it is in fact reality based. That is the reality. So, and in this case, it would have been non-bizarre, but even in the most bizarre, with, with the most bizarre content, always substantiate the nature of your patient's thought. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, uh, that uh, quote unquote abnormal thought. All of that said, let's say for teaching purposes that we find collateral information, et cetera, there is no evidence that what she is telling us uh, is substantiated, that that is not the reality. Uh, we might then identify her thought as a delusion, right? Now, tell me the difference between a delusion and a milder form of abnormal thought, such as an obsession or preoccupation. Where's that line to draw? Why are we why are we using the D word here? This, and this comes up on exams. It's more like a thought. It's like an intermediate thought about like what's going on. <laughs> no, you're 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 right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about intermediate, because we can actually reframe it as severity. All right. So if you're looking at this and if you're plotting this along a, a y-axis of severity, what's that point on that line in which you would say, all right, the severity is consistent with a delusion versus anything before this point, which may be an uh, up. Um, Obsession versus a preoccupation. Psychologically significant distress or impairment. Well, both both can. You, let's say, okay. Right. I mean, I mean, hypothetically, you can have somebody come in who's delusional, mm -hmm. uh, and somebody who come in who's coming in with severe OCP, OCD, yeah. and my patient to the right is going to need hospitalization, whereas I feel comfortable as an outpatient practitioner to continue outpatient practice. So. Now, uh, you're right. I mean, I think more times than not, that's not the case. But again, um, that's not necessarily where to, I think, initially look. I think OCD stuff, are they like repetitive or not waiting? Or the delusion is more stable? More stable, okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Especially, and, and that's largely because of the condition in which they're, right? I mean, for delusions, we're, we're usually talking about chronic conditions mm -hmm. um, where um, the other, uh, chronic and persistent, I should say. Uh, because even though OCD may be chronic, um, it's not as persistent. It's usually episodic in nature. That that is true. Yeah. The the other highlight here that I want to make sure everybody understands, if not for um, a, a clinical parole, which may or may not be reflected on your shelf exam, is insight. Insight, uh, and you may not actually get this from your primary psychiatric evaluation from the first visit, but if the patient is able, and they're not going to spoon feed you this. Uh, Exam they will, because you only have that much <laughs> to, to provide, <laughs> provide information. Uh, but if your patient, to paraphrase, um, is able to say, you know, doc, I know the way this sounds, but dot, 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 that's expressing some level of insight. Um, and then on the other hand, if you um, bring up to them consciousness rays, that um, it doesn't appear that aliens did visit you. Uh, if they take a step back and identify you as one of them, uh, that's not expressing or not demonstrating any insight, right? So uh, insight is where you really want to look. Insight would be the label of that y-axis. Okay, now, um, and I think we may have touched on this before. It's probably worthwhile discussing, especially in the context of this very conversation. In 2013, the APA, in their latest revision, complicated things just a little bit. And that we do have, like for instance, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, with no insight, which totally undoes what I just said, yeah. right? Which is, and when I read this, I thought, fudge. Right? <laughs> uh, but because of um, what we already um, and previously discussed, this does make sense, believe it or not, because for these conditions that are episodic, uh, you can have episodes in which the individual has no insight, and the next day have an episode in which they absolutely do have insight. So the APA wanted to get away from this potential problem of clinicians saying, well, that's because on one day you have OCD and on the next day you have, next day you have schizophrenia mm -hmm. and now you're back to OCD again. So we can't do that. And by the way, nobody really does. Well, hopefully nobody ever does that. 
but uh, in these cases, we stick with the primary diagnosis. In this case, for example, it would be OCD. And, and we do have an appreciation that maybe due to stress-induced psychosis, an individual may actually present episodically on one day with no insight. So um, when, when you read those qualifiers, just know that it doesn't necessarily um, contradict anything that we're discussing this morning, that it actually does make some sense. Questions? So I've had patients before who after the antipsychotic, so like I was having this thought that I'm dead, for example, and now I know that's not true. So obviously now they have insight, but that's like clearly a delusion. Is that because of the treatment effects? Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Uh, again, and it, or or remember, biopsychosocial it could be due to stress, right? And if that stress, if that stressful event has come and went, um, you could try to wean the antipsychotic because maybe it is not one hundred percent due to the treatment effect, and in a way, hopefully not, right? Um, but uh, that's trial and error, and that's patient uh, patient centered care, um, the proverbial um, um, case by case basis. Yep, that's but that's uh, yeah, that could definitely happen. Can you clarify the difference between an illusion and a delusion? Yeah. Yep. So um, both are considered to be perceptual disturbances. Uh, one is cued by an object in one's immediate environment, right? So, uh, and and I think one of the more common ones that present as a clinical vignette on a um, shelf exam is the individual tells you that they were visited by a specter or a ghost. And you identify that it was probably uh, the vent blowing on the curtain in a dark corner of the room, right? Hopefully. Um, whereas the um, uh, the hallucination, in this case, the visual hallucination, is not cued by an object in the room. So there's no misinterpretation of a real cue or stimulus. Uh, that would be a uh, hallucination. In this case, the visual hallucination. There's also a, another kind of related term called the idea of reference. Um, the other term for this idea of reference is the delusional misidentification. So uh, an individual, and, the, and these were considered, that is, ideas of reference uh, to be a Schneiderian uh, or first rank symptom of schizophrenia. That is, it was thought previous to 2013 that if you actually demonstrated uh, an idea of reference that you've likely had schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder that these conditions or these perceptual experiences were specific to psychotic processes, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. And here it's a two-step process. The individual identifies something in their immediate environment that every other person would also agree and support and validate. Uh, and then they misinterpret it. So uh, uh, at a delusional level. And the easy example is the proverbial subway pusher where um, my patient identifies that there was an individual that was standing on the platform of a subway and the two eyewitnesses support that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, however, um, my patient also identifies that there was someone close to her that was about to harm her. And therefore he pushed her, him in front of an oncoming train. Right, so delusional misidentification two-step process. It is the delusional interpretation of a real based stimulus in one's environment, um, and uh, that was thought to be very specific to a psychotic process such as schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Right. Anything else with Elaine? Yeah. Definitely call this clinical distress because she like draws oh, yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And she gets obsessive and she like writes out a list of who could be who's writing who's making these images. And it's interesting because like the content of the personalities are very like yeah, so that, that brings up another interesting point in that when um, we don't usually do this when it comes to obsessions, we do this more when we think the individual has zero insight and we think these thoughts, these abnormal thoughts are attributable to a delusion. But there are five themes, right? Um, uh, but they apply here, right? So her obsession with this mannequin may be JPEGs, right? It could be jealous, it could be persecutory, erotomatic, grandiose, or somatic. Um, I don't know if it's grandiose or persecutory, 
Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, in in a way, the American Psychiatric Association does have a, a qualifier for this called mixed. So if, if you are on this site as a clinician, I guess you could select mixed type. Yeah. By the way, a little tangent here, um, mixed type, Stephen King movie. What character? In this case, would parallel if we decided Elaine was delusional, which she's not, um, but had a mixed delusion incorporating both um, grandiose and persecutory. Now, in Stephen, Stephen King's character, I don't think, no, it's not, uh, it's, it's mixed. But it's not the same two themes. For, I mean, that helps. We have, anybody, we have anybody playing at home that wants to put it up in the uh, chat room? <laughs> Any Stephen King fans hanging out this morning? No. Misery. Mm -hmm. Anybody here see me, sir? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here read misery? No, no. no. <laughs> so so I, I I I guess I I asking if you've seen the Broadway show is way off the table here, right? Awesome. There was a Broadway show. All right. So okay. All right. I feel like I'd be more likely to watch yeah, the Broadway yeah. show than yeah, me too. Show's good. Yeah, yeah. Show's great. Yeah. I saw it with uh, Bruce Willis. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Alrighty. Um, characters other than Elaine Bennis, Seifeld, the pie. Oh, Jordan Swisher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was an interesting journey for him because he's like so obsessed with getting the suit. He like went through all these lengths to get it. He's very anxious about this interview, like to the point of acting in this odd way. And then he finally gets the suit. And he was like hypersensitive suddenly to the sound that it's making and convinced that everyone could hear that everyone's bothered by it. And it feels like very, I mean, so some of that sounds like sensory processing issues or like almost an autism spectrum disorder kind of issue going on, especially the social issues he has mm -hmm. afterwards. He's there and he's like having trouble connecting with these people to like just be accepted. But I think it all just goes back to like the underlying anxiety that he like is really struggling with and like really impact the function in all areas. Yeah. Yeah. And it, um and you know the the neurologic term is misophonia. Um I, I don't think George has that because uh, I really don't see it in other episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh so there's something else going on here. Um uh, and you know again if George is whether it's psychotherapy, whether it's even an initial eval due to this very um uh, HPI. Um, you know, I'm just wondering how much of it is in his in his interpretation, because there are other episodes, and again, this is cheating, but this is also called a past psychiatric history, um, where he openly admits that anything that positive happens to him must come with some type of contingency, mm -hmm. right? This, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the universe would never allow me to be this happy. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, and we, and we all know where he gets it by now. Uh, but, um, and again, I know that this is young Sheldon's last season. Yeah, when is yeah. Larry David going to have young George? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, where's, Net where's Netflix? I mean, uh, but, um, and, and by the way, they need not one, but they need at least, oh, I would say three to a half dozen psychiatrists yes. consulting on the script. One of my questions is like, is it ADHD? Because like sometimes you see someone having an emotion and all that, and then you see like anxiety, and then you see the ADHD. I think you're saying, yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, it's a common theme that he just can't keep a job yeah. either. Yeah. So that like, quit, yeah. hold, get fired. Exactly. He's not great at focusing. It's impulsive. Inattentive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I, I would, yeah, I think ADHD might actually be in the differential here. That's, that's fair. Yep. Yeah, uh, and again, I, 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 ADHD or no ADHD, uh, early childhood experiences clearly have shaped this individual's adult behavior, uh, where he's he is under the belief uh, that um, if anything good happens to him, 
uh, there's there, there, something negative is going to come of it. And, um, you know, he, he overly focuses on the sound his whooshing makes with these new pants. This is the perfect suit until it's not. All right, we have time for uh, one more uh, focus discussion. Any other characters you want to discuss here? Nothing else. We're good. All right, we're going to keep it here. Um, two minutes. We're going to log off, uh, log immediately back on to our other link for um, table rounds. Here, everybody, back then. Speaking of the show, I'm looking for like depiction of AOC. What kind of like? Is it? I really enjoy it. Uh, with so many of your behaviors, it's like, yeah, that is the problem.